Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In this time of disagreements, there's at least one thing that I think everyone is agreed upon. That is, there is evil in this world. I don't know anyone who questions that statement. We all look around, we all say, there's something wrong. We all might sigh. Why is this world so broken? There are, of course, those who see this as a problem for Christians, for those who believe in a God who is both all-powerful and good. In fact, it's been called the problem of evil. Maybe you've heard of that before. The problem of evil is this. How can there be a God who is all-powerful so that he could put an end to evil, and good so that he would want to, and yet still we see in this world evil. We see that things are not right. To the minds of these people, it would be like saying, there is the world's best lifeguard standing over this pool, and yet how do we explain that day after day kids are drowning? They come to the conclusion then that the problem of evil proves there is no God Evil, like we see it, could not exist if there were the kind of God that we believe in. Now, of course, we come to a different conclusion when it comes to the problem of evil. But yet, it's true, Christians do have to wrestle with a problem called evil. And it's not just a hypothetical problem. It's one that we come into contact with day after day. Just turn on the evening news. It's also one that that smashes us sometimes like a 300-pound linebacker when suddenly we are suffering and calling out to God, why am I enduring such pain in this world? Now, if you're thinking that I'm going to give you a neat and a tidy answer to the problem of evil, I'm sorry that I'm going to disappoint you. The reality is this. We don't always have an answer to the question, why? We acknowledge that God's ways are not our ways, that the mind of God is unsearchable to us. There are things that we simply cannot know. I'm not going to answer the question, why, today. But I would say that we should be asking another question whenever we are faced with evil, whenever we are confronted with the problem of evil, and that question is, who? Who is God? Uh, who is the God that stands behind all things, the God of this universe? It's when we point our eyes to that question, who, that yes, we can find comfort even when our eyes are filled with the problem of evil in this world. And we have a case study of sorts in the problem of evil as it was faced by an individual in this world. We'll look at the account from our first lesson from the book of First Kings Something that happened 800 years before Jesus walked on this earth. And it was a time of trouble. In fact, if you were here last week, you heard the beginning of this account. You heard that it was a time where God had brought trouble on that portion of the earth through God-caused climate change. Climate change in the form of a severe drought Climate change that came because God had said to his people, if you are unfaithful to me, if you turn your back to me, then this bad thing will happen. In this case, it was a severe drought. Yet in the midst of this terrible time, God preserved his prophet, a man named Elijah. When all of the shelves of the grocery stores were empty, God provided food for Elijah. He sent him he sent him out of the region of Israel. He sent him to the home of a widow. And there he provided for this widow and her son. God is good. You could almost hear them say, God is good. Every time the buzzer went off and the widow went to her oven and pulled out a loaf of what was truly wonder bread, as God had provided an endless supply of flour and oil to preserve the life of this widow and Elijah and this widow's son. God is good. Until, of course, it seems like he's not. 
The widow had obviously already suffered one of life's greatest tragedies in losing her husband. But her saving grace was the fact that she still had her son. Uh, she still had her son who would be able to carry on the family name. A son who would be able to provide for her some measure of security in her old age. Yes, she had lost her husband. This was tragic. But the even greater nightmare would be to lose her son. And then it happened. It happened so that for this widow, the problem of evil was not philosophical, nor was it hypothetical, nor was it something that a pastor once talked about in a sermon she heard. It was very real, as real as the lifeless body of her son that she hung on to in her arms. And what did she do to answer that question, why? Where did she turn? Notice she turned immediately to an explanation. Why did this evil happen to me, to my son? Well, she thought she knew the answer. She said, what have you against me, O man of God? Talking to Elijah. You have come to bring me, or you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. Who did the woman blame for this evil that had just come to her home, to her? She blamed herself, didn't she? She had, in her own mind, a sense that her guilt, something in the past, was the cause of this evil now happening in the present. That God was bringing about his justice, punishing her by taking away what was nearest and dearest to her heart. And it seemed to her quite an irony that this prophet from God who had come to bring the life-giving aroma of bread to her home, now it seems brought the stench of death. Why is it that in, in moments of tragedy and in deep sadness, we are reaching for an explanation? What is it that causes us to want to be able to say, this is what caused this? It's a deep need that we all have. I think part of it is that there is a desire to explain so that we can properly direct our anger and blame those who are responsible. There's also a sense that if we can explain, then maybe somehow we can also control the situation. Of course, there are times when there is an explanation we know that in this circumstance, there was a drought in Israel because the people had turned their back on God. God's word tells us this. God had caused the drought. We know that when evil comes, sometimes there is an explanation. A brings about B. If you drive after you have drunk too much and you get into an accident, there is a clear explanation as to what caused the evil. But just as often... There is not a clear explanation, an easy answer to say, this is what caused this, I know it without a doubt. Why did this woman's son have to die? If she had lived today and she had brought her son to the hospital, the experts would have told her. It was this reason, it was this reason condition that, she was, that he was born with. And in some ways, they would have an, a natural explanation that didn't fit with the way that she thought in the ancient world where all of the evil in this world was assigned to the gods being angry. A drought was caused because the gods were angry. My son lost his life because I, in my past, did something wrong. We might look at this woman and think her problem was that she was too primitive. Her ideas about what caused evil, they simply were too ancient. She needed to catch up, catch up with the times. But, but I would ask you, in our modern age, where almost everything is given a purely natural explanation, have we done away with the guilt 
that so heavily plagues people when evil happens. I would argue that mom guilt, dad guilt is still very much alive and active today. And since it's brought up in this text, I think it's worth talking about. How do people answer the question of evil today? Why was my child born with this condition? How many moms haven't struggled with the guilt of thinking, I did something. It was during my pregnancy when I didn't do enough of this, when I exercised too much, or when I exercised not enough, when I ate the wrong foods, or why is this condition something that my child has to struggle with? Is it because I'm feeding him the wrong thing? I was buying organic, but my husband kept making a stink that I broke the budget too often. Of course, the kind of guilt I'm talking about, the regret that we live with is not just something that parents deal with. It's something that we all deal with in all areas of our life. Thinking that we can answer that question, why? Without a doubt. And I would offer this, that that while it's true in our modern world, we have an understanding of things like viruses and disease and, and changes to our climate. That it's too simplistic to think that these alone answer every question that we have. That, that we would take the God of the universe out of the equation. That we would forget that he stands behind all things. And when we go to that question, why does evil happen? Certainly we can say theologically that the Bible tells us sin. Sin is what is the cause of all of the evil and the brokenness of this world. But when it comes to the pain that I experience personally, why does this happen to me? There is a time for us to admit that we do not know. We don't have an answer to every question of why. And I think there's room for us to have more humility in this regard. If you want to make God laugh, so to speak, just pretend like you have everything figured out. We can take our cues from the prophet Elijah in this circumstance. I think there's something for us to see. He did not try to correct the woman in this moment. He didn't try to say, it wasn't you. Nor did he explain to her germ theory and and tell her that malnourishment probably played a part in her son's demise. No, he didn't answer the question, why? What he did was this. He took this woman's son from her arms went upstairs to his own private room and he called out to his God in a very direct and startling way to us. He didn't soften his words. He didn't say, God, why did you allow this son to die? This is what he said. Have you brought calamity on this widow by killing her son? In other words, the problem of evil is not solved simply by inserting the word allows. God allows evil. As if God doesn't stand behind all things. As if God does not ever send sadness into our lives. No, the problem of evil is not answered by asking the question, why? As much as we might like to be like kids sneaking out of their rooms at night to overhear the conversation in the living room through their parents, uh, to overhear God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit discussing the day's events so we can understand why everything happened, that's simply not how it works. No, the question of evil is not answered by that question, why, but rather, who? Who is this God? What is his character? What do I know about him? What has he revealed to me? Truly, Elijah did not have an answer to the question, why? But he he knew the answer to the question, who? Who is God? The God who, yes, in justice, brought a famine and a drought to the land. And yes, a God who had power over all things, A God, yes, who had power over death itself. And so Elijah, in faith, stretched his body over this boy's 
dead body three times, calling out to the Lord. And the Lord in his power brought life back to lifeless hands and warmth back to a cold body. What amazes me about this account is the woman's response when Elijah came down and brought her living son back to her. It's very reasonable what she concluded at this moment in seeing her son. This is what she said. Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord is in, uh, in your mouth is truth. Why had her son died? You know what? In this case, we know because God's word tells us. In this case, we know that her son had died so that Elijah might perform this miracle through the power of his God And that she would, at the end of the day, know without a doubt that the word of God Elijah brought was true. And we ought to be like that woman in seeing this miracle and seeing that God's word, which he has revealed to us in his Bible, is true. All of it is true. You know, you can't help when you read this account to see the parallels between what happened with Elijah and this widow's daughter or this widow's son, and what happened in our gospel. The incredible pain of a widow. Pain that went from extreme sorrow to overwhelming joy. When Jesus came and brought his life-giving touch and raised a young man, restoring restoring him to his mother. And did you notice in our gospel what the reaction of the people was? Very similar to the reaction of the widow in the time of Elijah. A great prophet has risen among us. And do not miss the connection. One greater than Elijah had come. One who had the power over death itself. And we see in this account, yes, that the question of why... It doesn't always have a satisfactory answer. But who? Who is a question that we can turn to again and again and we see who stands behind all things. The God who has power over death itself. Our God who reaches down and brings life. Who came down to this world not to provide insights to solve the philosophical problem of evil, but who reached down in a very real way and took on human flesh so that by his death on the cross and by his resurrection, he might put an end to death itself. Yes, this is the answer to our question. This is where our eyes must turn. And we're still waiting for that day when Jesus will come back and he will restore all things and make them right. What I can tell you is this. We are one day closer. We're one day closer. Now on that day when Jesus comes, we won't look up and ask why. No, we'll have the question, who? Answered for us in the coming of our Lord. Who is this that comes? The one who brings us life. The one who is the ultimate answer to this problem of evil. Amen.